afternoon. Um, I'm here with my uh, guest, uh, Emily Pinnell, um, and I'll speak to uh, Emily uh, this afternoon on Poet to Poet, Writer to Writer. Uh, just to let you know that Ibbotson uh, Street 34, uh, this magazine right here, is, uh, which is affiliated with Endicott College in Beverly, Mass, is available. Uh, you can get it on Amazon.com or at Ibbotson Press, I-B-B-T-S-O-N Press.com, and we won, it, uh, we won the 2014 Pushcart Prize for work in that magazine, so we're very proud of, proud of that. Um, welcome to the show, Emily. Thank you. Uh, Emily uh, went into the wilds of Somerville. It can be very, um, <laughs> very confusing, but here she is in the uh, Paris of New England, uh, ready to uh, uh, conduct an interview. Uh, I have had the pleasure, um, well, I'll read you a little um, introduction to Emily. Emily Pinot studies creative writing at Endicott College. Uh, her poetry has appeared in the anthology Like One Poems, One Poems for Boston, and in newspapers and literary journals such as the Somerville Times, now it was once the news, oh. the Endicott Observer, uh, the Endicott Review, Ibbotson Street, and Muddy River Poetry Review. In 2012, her poem I Would For You was nominated for a Pushcart Prize, which is very impressive. And it wasn't by the Endicott magazine, it was by a totally different magazine. Um, in 2013, the Ibbotson Street Press published her poetry collection, No Need to Speak, as part of the Endicott College Ibbotson Street Press Young Poetry uh, Series. Um, so um, welcome, um, Emily. Thank you. Um, Emily, um, you know, every poet um, has, has mentors uh, who, you know, guided them along the way. And, um, I, m I imagine you have a number of them. Um, can you... Tell you, tell us who uh, mentored you. I mean, how did you know you had? Did you have the poetic impulse before you came to Endicott College? Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, I had always written like uh, start try to start novels, and I tried to write short stories. I would write like children's stories, and I always wrote poetry every once in a while. And but when I came to Endicott, my thought wasn't poetry, it was just writing. Mm -hmm. But when I started taking creative writing classes, when I had creative writing with uh, Professor Scholar, he um, did a lot with poetry and then I like realized how much more like I really liked it. And the more I was writing and the more I was showing it to him, the more I re realized that it's something I wanted to pursue. So he was your first, so to speak, serious. I know, I, I know somewhere that you had a high school teacher as well who was inspirational too, is that true? Yeah, I had an um, English high school teacher. Um, he actually passed away in, when I was in high school, but uh -huh. yeah, he, um, he pushed me to, I ended up in honors English, and then so I was like, I knew that I wanted to pursue English for my major in college, so. So, um, uh, so, so I mean, what is it about you know, you know, there are certain qualities a mentor would have, and sometimes it's very individualized because we all have different sensibilities. Mm -hmm. um, what was it about Sklar that uh, you say was your first one? Oh yeah, he was very personable. Like, mm -hmm. cared about me as a person, and like, like he knows that everyone has their own individual voice when it comes to poetry, and it, he helped me find mine. And it's funny because the way that he writes is similar to how I write. So How would you describe the way you write? Well, I don't rhyme, and I don't really have a set form other than like free verse. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just write naturally instead of like, like planning things out and just write like simplistically. Nothing fancy, no like big metaphors or anything like that. Why? Because I just feel like Life's complicated enough, so you don't really need to to yeah, make it into this yeah. huge thing, you know. But you, but but within the simple, I think the simple everyday, um, you know, tasks of you know everyday life, you find you know layers of meaning, um, you know, the, yeah. you know, it, it, and that's evident in your book, No Need to Speak, which again was part of the Endicott College of Ibsen Street Press Young Poet series, and we also had another young poet uh, we've also published. Uh, you're joining this. Uh, whole line of uh, great poets from Endicott College is uh, Megan Perkins, mm -hmm. and she wrote uh, Sunshine Girl. Sun, oh God, I should remember the other one. <laughs> you remember the name? Uh, uh, it's sun, something to do with sunshine. sunshine. Yeah, girl, girl War Sunshine. Yeah, the Girl War Sunshine. And, you know, we're trying to, you know, we're hoping that this is going to go on for a while, and, you know, people remember, it's like the Yale younger poets, we're going to have the Endicott um, young poets, so that's great. 
Um, and who else? I mean, you know, um, who else did you did spark you? Um, uh, you? You know, you've taken a lot of English courses over the years there. And who else? Is anyone else that sparked your interest in well, both? Well, you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't looking for. But, uh, no, I know, but yeah. There's any any other faculty members and things that you mentioned? Oh, I'm sure there's. I can't think of them all right now, but yeah. the whole English department really. Yeah. They're all very supportive, and Charlotte Gordon. Um, Professor Alexander, they're all very supportive of my writing. Professor Alexander was very supportive of my um, like writing essays and stuff like that. Great. So just any support is made a huge difference because it's like when I started out, I never thought I, any of this would happen. I never thought anything would come of my poetry. Well, one of your poems uh, uh, um, refers back to that as something like what you know. You want to know when you are a writer. Yeah. Right? yeah. So. Yeah, I never, yeah, I never thought I could ever call myself one. I always thought it was something that, it was something I'd become later on. Yeah, it's not like certi uh, certification. Yeah. Uh, you're a writer. You know, mm -hmm. just, uh, uh, you, you, you've also, um, in your career, and, and uh, you've interviewed a number of poets like uh, Marge Percy, and maybe there were, and weren't formal interviews, but your articles you've written, and then you've spoken to Dewitt Henry, who was the founder of Plowshares Magazine. Mm -hmm. And you've spoken to Fred Marchand, yep. right? Uh, who was the head of the Poetry Center at Suffolk University. Um, you know, um, from one interviewer to another, because you're an interviewer. How do you, you know, how do you, wh what makes for an evocative question for you? I mean, you want to get something out of someone, you know, try to reveal something, you know. Um, what do you do? What do you do? Well, when I, the only person I really interviewed was Marge Piercy, like, in right. terms of, like, questions like, um, what I did is I just looked back, like... But even for an article, you're going to... That's right, true. Right, yeah, yes. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, look, like, where they come from. Like, do a little research. And, because, like, for Marge Piercy, I knew that she came from Wellfleet. And I have a connection to Wellfleet because I have a summer home in Wellfleet. So I guess something that I do is try to find a way I relate to the person. And then... You must have made a lot of money of your own summer home in Wellfleet from this book, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you, all right, so there's a commonality there, right? Yeah, so yeah. I guess I find things that I have in common with the person and kind of, like, see, like, what they like and see how I can relate. Right, okay. Because then it makes it easier to ask questions. And you want to try to relate, and um, anything else? Um, you did research, right, also about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I did research, like, what, like, themes... Right. Like, so a lot of my questions would probably be based around the themes of their writing and uh, stuff like that. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, then we were just we touched on this a, a bit earlier. You, you seem to have a, a conversational, casual style to your work. Um, have you ever worked in metered form? You know, uh, rhyming, it's formal yeah. rhyme. And Actually, all that. Yeah. yeah, I used to before I went to college. When I would write poems, I would rhyme, and it would be cliche and all that stuff, but I broke out of it once I took But there's nothing wrong with me to grow. Oh, no, there's no. nothing rhyme with it, wrong with it nothing at all. Rhyme with nothing it. rhyme with it. Right, right. And there's right. nothing wrong with it, but um, it's just I not mean, for me. What, what do you find uh, more attractive about free verse as opposed to um, metered? I feel like it's more free. Like yeah, I it's more free verse. Right? It, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you feel constricted by the, um, you know, the requirements of, you know, having a meter? Yeah. Okay, so it, it, I often tell students that sometimes, you know, the, um, and I think metered poetry is great, don't get me wrong, but I say sometimes if people, you know, they don't want to lose the poem just so they can get a rhyme, you know, the rhyme takes over from the poem. Exactly. Have you found that happen yeah, with you at all? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Do you use internal rhyme at all in your poetry? If I ever do, it's by accident. It's by accident. Yeah. But you could see where it might be affected. Oh, yeah, emphasis. definitely. No, there's nothing wrong with it, and I appreciate when people do uh, it. Yeah. It's just... It's just not for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a poem in your collection, uh, Hey, You Are a Writer Now, I believe that's the title. Yeah. Right. Um, so, um, do you feel that you've achieved that lofty position yet? Uh, do you consider yourself a writer? I think I think now I do. Okay. It took, took a while to get there, but... So but it's not like, oh, I'm better than everyone else, I'm a writer. No, I know that, no. But, you know, it's just like, yeah. So, uh, what, you know, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? What, you know, what made you feel that you could say you're a writer and not feel like you're posing or being pretentious? 
I think it was actually when I recently did a reading um, with my book in Lynn, and it was like I was the featured uh, poet speaker, and I had like 30 minutes to, to read, and it was just, it was strange because it was like I was the person, like usually I'm the one in the audience looking at the poets and right. writing a review, but I was the person that people were looking at, and it's just like over time just doing poetry readings, and just my book in general being out there, it made me feel more like it. And how do you keep an audience engaged when you're up there? I'm sure you have a technique when you're up there, you know, doing your poetry. Well, I'm always, well, when starting out, I was always as nervous as anything. Like, I'd be shaking and trying to... Yeah, I remember you. And how, how long have we known each other? For maybe two years? or you know? um, th Three years. Three years now. Yeah. You were very kind of really timid at first. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And very shy. It took but very, you know, very gung-ho. Yeah. But now? Yeah, just over time, just, like, I'm slowly starting to. I'm not fully there yet, but... No, no, you got to do God, <laughs> you know, sometimes you don't get there until, you know, much later. But but you're you're well on your way to, uh, to, uh, to be, you know, you have already have publications, you have push cart nominations, so I didn't get that until I was in my mid-30s. <laughs> no, more than that, actually. I was in in my 40s until I got um, a push card nomination. Um, you, you know, you've got a book, which I didn't have my first book until I was in my 40s. Uh, and you have, um, you, you did reading credits, you've interviewed all these major poets. And, and you know, that's great because I think, you know, um, you, I remember when I was starting out and doing this, I just thought, oh, writer, but, you know, you, can, you really gotta do, you know, you, it's, it's not a serious pursuit or something, and I yeah. felt I had to do other things. It wasn't too much later that I devoted myself more to it, um, but it's good that you've, you know, you've gotten this experience. And even if you not do it for a living, you'll always have something yeah, to fall back on. And you know, a lot of people do other things, teach or, or they, um, you know, have other jobs. But they're, you know, tech tech writers who are poets on the side and things like that. So, but I think you have a career ahead of you. And, you know, we'll be, I'll be anxious to see what happens. Um, you know, like Marge Piercy, uh, a recurrent theme of yours are cats, uh, the <laughs> frequent visitors in your in your poems. What is it about the, these creatures? And I love cats too, so, you know, as we were discussing before the show. Well, I've grown up with cats my whole life, so, uh -huh. and I've always loved just, I just love their personalities. They're, they're like people. They're like companions, and I just love how they're, they're so mysterious, and they're just so, like, I don't know, I just feel like they're just a part of my personality. You're a cat person as opposed to dog person. Well, I don't hate dogs. I, I no, I'm not saying about hate, but I mean, well, you know, I mean. I know, but yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I'm a cat person, but I mean, I love dogs too. Yeah. But I'm more, more cat. Yeah. Well, your cat's too demonstrative. I mean, dog's too demonstrative, or they're, you know, they're not very subtle in their affection. And, or, no, I just want my little kitty on my lap. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, some, there's something about that. And um, you appreciated Marge Percy's uh, cat poems. I yeah. Noticed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what other themes do you like to write about? Let's. Um, um, I write about nature. I write a lot about permanence and relationships and stuff like that. Okay. Permanence. Tell tell me a bit about that. Well, because I feel like so often in life, when you meet like a friend or when you have a connection with someone, there's always that. Like oh, it's not gonna last, and people are gonna go their separate ways, and same with college. Like I'm not gonna be here forever. Just like the concept of like people move on with their lives, but I like the idea that you don't have to move on, and that you can take people with you, and that you don't have to separate from people. Because I have like an attachment problem. Like I always get attached to objects and people and places. Is that a problem? You think? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Too attached. <laughs> too you're attached. Too, you're too attached, right? Yeah, right. I just, I, I'm very grounded. Like, I, I love. Well, like you, like you were saying, you're a homebody and things yeah, like that. Yeah, I'm a homebody yeah. and I get attached to people. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I can see that uh, as being a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, yeah. Being a good, like anything you want to extreme, but also on, on good quality because, you know, everything, every, in this culture, everyone wants the next big thing, the next splashy object, and, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. And so there's something, you know, Charming about someone who wants permanence, you know, and wants, um, you know, some roots and things like that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, um, and you told me you're working on a novel. 
Yeah. Mod, uh, what's what's the novel? We just maybe want to touch on that. Uh, what you're doing with the novel? Yeah. Well, it's a young adult novel. Well, I hope it would be. And. Um, well, ho hopefully you'll be finished when you're a young adult, right? <laughs> 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 right. Just joke. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, just brief synopsis, if you want to call it that, about a girl who is in love with someone who may or may not be real. And it's, the con it's like the concept of reality and what it means to be for something to be real and stuff like that. So do you ever start out with a concept before you write a poem? Or is it, you know, you know it just ca it came, um, or it just comes naturally to you see something and, you know, it grabs your imagination? Or do you start out with saying, I have this concept I'm work I, I want to relay well, in the poem? Recently, well, as of this past summer, what I've been doing is I've been writing a poem every day. And what I do Are is... Are you part of that project? There's some sort of project where you write a poem no. every day? No, okay. No. This is my own project. No, okay. <laughs> the Emily Pinot project, yeah. <laughs> what I do is every night before I go to sleep, I... Well, this is an example of how I would use technology in, like, a... a not for, like, you know, just mm -hmm. technology, but to write. So at night, I write on my phone a part of a poem, maybe not the full poem, but a few lines, and then um, I have each month, I look back and I finish each poem, so then I have a poem that I write every day. So what I usually do is a, a few lines, maybe that are in my head, that's what I turn into a poem. Sometimes it's something that I saw that day, it's something that I experienced, a feeling. It's not always the same, it's like all, all different things, but sometimes it's just like a line, and then I just go from there. Okay, great. Well... Proof is in the pudding, as I always say. So for the next uh, you know, 13 minutes, you can read whatever you want. Um, and uh, it's, it's up to you. And um, go ahead. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to read the first poem that's in my book called Sharing What is Stolen. When you think about it or don't think about it, or refuse to think at all. All lines, all of the lines are stolen because all words have been used before us. We all share these words and all us writers do is simply organize them into phrases and sentences and make us feel these stolen feelings that have already been felt before from someone else's life and words and meaning that poured from their pen, their mouth and their skin all over onto the next life in which we share, yet it is still stolen, because it is recycled and used and isn't ours, because it was theirs. So we speak these words that have been wrinkled and sweated in, and we write our names in them, staking our claim when we have none at all, because they are stolen. And we didn't pay for the copyright or make monthly payments to the dead, so therefore we are not legally entitled to speak or write anything at all in any order because we are all breathing stolen time. Okay, so next one I'll read. This one is called Breathing It In. When people were on the track team or on the swim team, or doing any sport or club in high school, and they complained about it, I always thought to myself, then why do it? I figured they were being forced, or they were forcing themselves for whatever reason. But in most cases, they actually loved it. And now, as time goes on, I finally understand it, because I have the same relationship with writing. I make excuses, and I just feel so lazy sometimes. The words become like running, and I am out of breath. I don't f find myself running with it. I run away. I think of it as something I have to do because it is important. Sometimes important things make me tired. But I feel this new sense of exhilaration when I actually write something I like. It's like those mornings when you look in the mirror and think, hey, I don't look half bad. It becomes those moments that you live for when you dread the process. Like when you are panting, out of breath in the woods, left behind from the rest of your cross-country team and you just stop and look around you and realize where you are and why you are there, then you keep on going. And this one is called My Tracks. 
I remember the model trains in my grampy's basement, the remote control in my little hands, in control of all these tracks, my networks. I decide where the passenger and cargo cars turn, and stop and speed up, slow down. Something so mesmerizing about pressing buttons and pretending I can direct deliveries and travel plans. Imagining where these fake people will end up going once they step off. Train, uh, what were you saying about trains? Uh, model trains, yeah. Oh, uh, model trains. Something about trains that are always fascinating when you, when, you, when you travel on trains. But you're neither here or there, you're in limbo. And, um, you know, you, you get to observe these people, but you can never achieve any sort of intimacy. And then, it, then they stop and they get off and they all go to their separate lives. Do so you, you travel on trains at all? Or? Not not usually, but probably I will for my internship. Oh. I'll probably do that. Oh, what's your internship? Well, I'm, it's not set in stone yet, but I'm possibly doing um, the AG&I magazine for um, Boston University. I don't oh. know if you heard of that. Oh. Possibly. Oh, the Boston University. Well, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Go ahead. Yeah. It's That's not great. set in stone, but... Nothing's set in stone, but I, I hope you'll get it. Thank you. You keep going. Okay. Got plenty of time. Okay. Body of work. <laughs> this one's called I Just Know. I know I had a past life in the 1800s because when I see acres of land, I want it. I just want it. I want to own it. I want to live on it. I feel like it's a part of who I am. But at the same time, I'm not interested in Little House on the Prairie and watching shows that take place back during that time and the way people dressed back then. I feel like I am an anti-1800s culture and society, but I was definitely from that time. I must have not liked how confined I felt, the way they lived. I knew there was more somehow. My favorite possession is my quill pen. I love writing with it, dipping it in the ink. I am forever attached to everything old. And there is something about Plymouth. I was in love with someone there hundreds of years ago, and I still am. There's a permanent relationship. <laughs> <laughs> you believe in past lives and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah. I do. What, wait, you know, everyone is like a prince, you know, in past lives or something like that. I mean, you know, I, you know no one's ever like a... Uh, Ordinary person. Ordinary person. Yeah, I think, I was, is, a, I think I was an ordinary person. Oh, yeah, what, what, what were you? If oh, you thought. I don't know. Oh, okay. Probably from the 1800s. Oh, okay. Girl. <laughs> Just girl, 1800s. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. This one's called After Reading The Fault in Our Stars by John Green. Now I'm on a quest. I call the Wellfleet Marketplace and ask if they carry any books by John Green. I need to read more books by John Green. The woman on the phone asked what type of books John Green wrote, and I almost said, amazing, life-changing, beautiful ones. But I said, young adult. Beyond a doubt, she replies. The phone was silent for a second. No, 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 I corrected her, young adult. Oh, let me check, she says to me, not understanding how desperately I want to read his books. I bit my lip. I kind of like the title, Beyond a Doubt. We have The Fault in Our Stars by John Green, the woman says, his name proudly, as though she accomplished something great. I want to tell her that I already read that one, but I don't. I act like it, she told me exactly what I wanted to hear. Now I'm at the beach, and I ask my dad, what does beyond a doubt mean? I feel like it's obvious, but I have thought about that phrase so much this afternoon that I think it's lost its meaning. Well, my dad began. Imagine a rock that's covered by a bucket in the sand right there. I look to where he is gesturing. Now, what happens if you walk away and then come back? Is the rock still there? I don't know. What if someone took it? Exactly. But before you walked away, you had beyond a doubt that that rock was under that bucket. I like that, I said. And that's all I could say. I like that. is called seeing you. I really like the expression I am seeing him rather than we are together or we are dating. 
even though it seems, it seems to mean the same thing. I love the concept of seeing someone, because it sounds like you are just looking at the person, which is funny in of itself. But then again, at the same time, it's like you're seeing something in the person that no one else can see. You know, I've noticed also a pattern in your poems. You, you, you sort of take apart words or exp common expressions. Oh, yeah. I have a thing about expressions. Some expressions yeah. I like and some don't. Yeah, so you sort of like put it under the microscope yeah. and, you know, stretch it every which way. And yeah. Just, yeah so like, like the expression, that thrills me, I love that expression. That, that thrills me? Or that doesn't thrill me. I just, uh, I really like that expression. There was this one uh, English woman I knew, she always said, oh, that's brilliant for everything. Yeah. And I'd say, oh, that's somebody, I like that. You know, oh, that's brilliant. It makes things that, you know, sound exciting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Okay. This one is called The Change in Us. It's incredible how much things can change in a few years, or even a few months, weeks, days, or right down to the very moment I touch you. Yet, a lot of the time, we say people can't change, or at least not that fast, because they get stuck in habits, and once they are bad, they have to always be bad, because that makes it easier for us, so we don't have to change ourselves in the way we look at them. I'm going to read that poem you mentioned, the Hey, You're a Writer Now. No, oh, okay. That's in my book. That would probably finish us off, right? Yeah. It's a long poem. Yeah. I am not a writer. In fact, I'm starting to wonder if I will ever really be able to call myself one. And now that I think of it, I'm not even sure what it means to be one. If I get published once, what does that make me? What if it's just an article or a poem, a short story? What if I get published twice or three times, in a magazine, a newspaper, online? What if someone reads it, or no one reads it? What if everyone reads it? Do I have to write a novel to be a writer? If that novel never gets published, does that make me an almost there kind of writer? What about a book of poems? Am I a poet then? Am I a poet right now? What if I write something, people read it, people love it, and then I never write again? Could I stop being a writer? Or is it a permanent kind of thing? Once a writer, always a writer. What if people start to realize that I'm not any good at all and I'm suddenly surrounded by people who are better? Maybe I have been surrounded all along. I could write for my entire life and never call myself a writer. I'd keep on telling people I want to be one, 